All right. Well, good afternoon and welcome to the December Crop Production and WAS debriefings. My name is Lance Honig and I serve as Acting Chair of the Ag Statistics Board here at NAS. This briefing is for the Secretary of Agriculture and other policymakers at USDA to better understand the content and context of today's reports. We are very pleased to have Robert Bonney, USDA's Undersecretary for Farm Production and Conservation, join us as our Secretary Designate today. And we also welcome Dr. Seth Meyer, USDA's Chief Economist. Mr. Secretary, Dr. Meyer, I'd like to share that we also have some visitors with us on the other side of the room here. Primarily, we have uh, some folks from our Farm Foundation Ag Scholar Program. Uh, also, we have our Director of USDA's Office of Partnerships and Public Engagement. So welcome to our visitors. Uh, while I'm at it, let me also express our appreciation to Mark Hudson. You know, it's a citrus month, month, and so therefore we've got him in from Florida helping out with our report. He'll be here shortly. Uh, he's got an interview he does right after the doors open. And so he'll join us shortly and be available uh, for any questions at the end. So rest assured he'll be here. Uh, before, I think, before I turn things over to our presenters, I do have a few notes for our live streaming audience. The crop production WASDA reports are considered principal federal economic indicator reports. The Office of Management and Budget provides specific guidance on how these important reports are to be released. OMB statistical policy instructs policymakers to refrain from making public comment regarding the content of these reports within one hour of their release. Therefore, we will not be taking questions from the public during this briefing. However, both NAS and World Board staff are available for phone or email questions, and NAS will host a social media event at 1 o'clock Eastern time today. We always strive to have everything presented at this briefing match the official record. However, should there be any discrepancy, always refer to the official published estimates. With that, I'm going to turn things over to Chris Hawthorne, Acting Chief of the NAS Props Branch. Chris will be immediately followed by Dr. Mark Jekinowski, Chair of the World Ag Outlook Board. So, Chris, podium is yours. Thanks, Lance. Welcome. And good afternoon. Um, we've got a lot to get started uh, to talk about today, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, first, I want to talk about the data sources we used, uh, the surveys that we conducted to uh, get to the data that we have today. Uh, first off, we have the objective yield uh, for cotton. Uh, we had a sample size of 840 plots, um, and we collected those uh, prior to harvest. Um, then we go into the objective, uh, objective measure for Florida citrus. Uh, we had 1,764 groves uh, that was conducted from November 6th through the 22nd. Um, and then we we also had the Cotton Ginning Survey, where we got data from 526 of our active gins uh, over the course of uh, November 29th through December 4th. Uh, the Jennings uh, was at, we were at 71.1% gin um, ahead of the five-year average of 65.2% uh, at this point. Now we'll give you a quick update on harvest progress for cotton. Uh, this graphic shows the percent of the crop harvested by week as reported on our crop progress report and the comparison over the last five years. Uh, as of November 26th, the cotton crop was 83% harvested. As you know, that's when our crop progress survey ends for the season. Um, and that compares to 79% uh, of, uh, of average. Take a deeper, uh, deeper dive into cotton here. Um, we did not have any planted or harvested changes from the previous forecast. That is normal for this time of year. Um, but uh, we did on planted, we, uh, we were down 25.6% um, at the 10.2 million acres um, from, the, from the previous year. Harvested also is, uh, harvest is up 9.8% uh, over, uh, over last year. Um, our yield is at 765 pounds per acre. That's down 2.3% from our uh, previous forecast and down 19.5% uh, from the previous year. Production at 12.7 million bales um, was down 2.4% from the previous forecast and down 11.7% from the previous year. So we got some drought going on in, in some areas and that's really dragging that down. 
So taking a look at a cotton yield, um, this graphic shows uh, the green line shows the published years uh, yields for the last 30 years. Uh, as you can see on this graph, um, the yield is actually, you can't see this on the graph because the yield to go back to where it was lower at this point, we have to go back to 2000. Uh, actually, you can see it from 2003, I apologize. Um, the uh, gray line is our trend line for the 30 years. This next uh, map um, shows cotton yield um, and the change from the previous month. Um, just a reminder, this map is set up for uh, anything that's highlighted in blue is an increase over last month. Anything that's highlighted in yellow or in, uh, in red is a decrease from the previous month. Um, any of the, the darker the shade, the, the larger the increase. Um, as you can see also on here, we have a record high yield in uh, Arkansas and in Tennessee. This next map is, uh, is set up similar, but it is a comparison uh, to the previous year. This is where we can really dig into that, uh, that issue in Texas and Oklahoma really dragging down that, uh, that yield. Um, so you can see, see what happened there in, uh, in Texas and Oklahoma, also Louisiana, and some of the Southern states were also down, um, you know, uh, moderately from last year. So taking a look at uh, cotton production, um, we're at 12.8 million bales right now, lowest since the, the 2009 season. Um, you can see how that's, uh, how that's kind of changed over this last 10 years. So cotton production, um, this, this uh, slide actually shows our uh, cotton production as compared to the industry expectations, those industry expectations are highlighted in blue. Uh, each one represents uh, an industry um, published estimate uh, prior to uh, our report. And then the red dot shows our, our estimate uh, as it was published. As you can see, there might be a slight, uh, a slight surprise, but uh, we're, we're right there below that group of, uh, of indications uh, at this time of the year. So um, probably not too bad of a surprise there. We're going to get into sugarcane now. Um, sugarcane uh, harvested um, at 924,000 acres uh, is up one tenth of a percent from uh, the previous estimate, uh, but it's also down uh, seven tenths of a percent from the previous year. Yield uh, is unchanged from the previous estimate, but down 4.6 percent from the previous year, and the total production is uh, 32.9 million tons. Uh, up three tenths of a percent from the previous forecast, but down five uh, five percent from the previous year. The drought in Louisiana um, is a big drag on that. Uh, they're down ten percent from the previous year. Florida is actually the second highest production on record. Their record was in 2020, but also Texas uh, was the lowest production since going back to 1972. <clears throat> Uh, now we're going to get into pecans. Uh, this is our pecan uh, second pecan forecast of the year um, at 251 and a half million pounds. Um, we're up 1.4 percent from the previous estimate, but we're down 9.4 percent from the previous year. Uh, as you can see, this is an uh, it's, we're still following an off on year uh, pattern, and uh, this is the off year in that alternating alternating uh, yield pattern. Now we'll get into the citrus estimate. Um, all oranges came in at 2.7 million tons. Um, one thing to, to remember is that we uh, only forecast, uh, we only have get, get new data from Florida this, uh, this month. Um, so all the other estimates that are not Florida are carried forward from the October forecast. Uh, so all, like I said, all oranges are at 2.7 million tons, no change from the previous estimate, but up 10.1%. Uh, from the previous year. Keep in mind that last year was a hurricane season, so we did expect that increase. Um, but as you can see, they are still dealing with some of that that greening problem, and and that yield, that that uh, production is uh, is is still hampered. Um, the non Valencia oranges at 1.8 million tons is up 4.3 percent from that hurricane season of last year, and the Valencia is um, is at 900,000 tons, up 24. 24% uh, from last year. 
going into grapefruit at 330,000 tons. Uh, it's up 6.8% from the uh, previous estimate and up nine tenths of a percent from the previous year. Uh, lemons, again, we don't have any uh, lemon forecast for Florida. So this is just carried forward from California and, and uh, Arizona from that previous forecast, but they are at 980,000 tons. And that was down 12.2% from the previous uh, year. Tangerines at 946,000 tons, uh, up two tenths of a percent from the previous estimate. Uh, but down 2.6% from the previous year. And that kind of wraps up the data. I'm just going to highlight some of the upcoming reports we have. We, As you can see, we have quite a few coming up on the, on the screen here. Starting with December 15th, we'll have our small grains county estimates, um, and that is a quick stats only release, no, no PDF version out there. Um, December 22nd, we'll have the cotton Jennings, the cattle on feed, and the hogs and pigs reports. Uh, December 29th, our ag prices goes out. Uh, January 2nd, we have our care reports. Uh, January 3rd, we have our citrus fruits final estimates, our non-citrus fruits and nuts final estimates, and our vegetables final estimates. Again, that's something we do every uh, every five years uh, to go back and look at those uh, estimates and, and have a chance to update anything over the last five years. Those are quick stats only releases as well as our on January 9th, our field crops uh, final estimates, uh, and then our grain stocks, um, and then our hay final estimates. Following that up with uh, January 11th, we have our hogs and pigs estimates, uh, final estimates again. Um, and then we'll be back in here again with our big reports, uh, Cotton Jennings, Crop Production Monthly, our crop production annual that everybody is looking at down the road, and uh, our grain stocks, our rice stocks, and then we'll have our first look at uh, the winter wheat and canola seedings for this upcoming year. All right, so uh, I want to remind everybody that we have the big 100th anniversary of our uh, 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 Agricultural Outlook Forum. It's a great uh, event held across the river in, in Arlington. Um, remind everybody online and here in the, in the office that uh, you can register to attend here on this link. Uh, whether you want to attend both uh, either in person or virtually, it's a hybrid event. So I encourage everybody to go and, and register for that to, to see all the speakers. And then uh, we have uh, Mr. Lance Honig, uh, acting chief, uh, acting chair of the Ag Statistics Board, is going to be hosting our uh, Ag our Stat Chat there on X, uh, starting at one o'clock today. So uh, if you have any questions, uh, fire away. Lance will be there to answer those for you. If you have questions about this report or any of our other reports, he can answer those. And that's all I've got for you. So. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Mark Jakanowski and he'll give the WASDE briefing. Thank you. Yes. All right, thank you, Chris. And uh, welcome to the role of uh, standing behind the podium. Uh, <laughs> nice work. Um, so I'm gonna walk through the uh, walk through the WASD here. Uh, changes this month, uh, give you a little bit of a perspective on what we did and why we did it. Uh, as you know, I mean, December for us, relatively light month in terms of, um, particularly in terms of the uh, domestic supply changes you saw from Chris, we got information on cotton and sugar cane. So uh, relatively minor uh, changes to most of the U.S. balance sheets. Um, did get that information on cotton that we'll talk more about. And also we made some uh, changes in the global cotton consumption. I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. And uh, we'll go through a bit of a focus on Brazil's soybean production forecast. So let's start out with wheat, as we always do, uh, global wheat production. Uh, just going back to the back year real quick, uh, kind of truing up some uh, late date estimates, uh, increase in Australia's crop that's based on uh, a bears uh, data recently released. And, uh, and then not listed in that uh, list of countries, but notable for the back year is a, um, a reduction in Afghanistan's production by 700,000. Uh, and that's based on government data, uh, uh, based on their yearbook as well. Um, out year, current year, um, increase in Australia, million tons. Uh, again, this is uh, government data, Canada, 
up as well. So that would add to 2 million tons, but again, not listed in that uh, chart is a offsetting reduction in Brazil by a million tons. That's based on uh, Konabi data. Uh, world supply and demand uh, balance sheet here. A uh, few things worth noting. Um, total supply, we talked about production up uh, this month. Uh, feed use, uh, that's uh, higher feed use in um, EU, uh, where uh, EU wheat imports were up as well. Uh, also higher feed use in Indonesia, South Korea, Australia, and Thailand. Uh, also worth noting, uh, food, seed, and industrial raised for China. Uh, so that's up this month. Uh, trade, 2.2 uh, million ton increase. That is primarily Australia. U.S., which we'll talk about in a second, Ukraine, and Canada. Uh, Ukraine's exports we raised by half million, half million tons to 12, 12 and a half. And uh, ending stocks down half million tons this month. And that would, would we're now, I mean, we're at the lowest ending stocks since 2015 16, globally, of course. U.S. balance sheet, uh, get, as I noted before, not a whole lot going on here, but uh, it is worth noting uh, our uh, change in the export in, in our uh, export forecast. That's all SRW, and this is reflecting these big uh, big sales we saw to China recently. So um, we actually raised SRW 30 million bushels, slightly offset by uh, lower uh, uh, exports of white wheat down 5 million. So uh, nets out to 25 million bushel increase in our export forecast. Um, and uh, we ticked our price a little bit higher, 10 cents uh, a bushel, just reflecting some recent strength there. Uh, rice production, moving into rice. Um, Argentina, that's an area change uh, based on Agmin data. Maybe not too surprising given the high prices, that's providing some incentive to increase area there. Uh, Thailand uh, up a bit as well. That's based on a post report. Uh, better uh, improved uh, water availability for the dry season crop there. Uh, global rice balance sheet. Uh, again, fairly small changes. We talked about production. Uh, trade down a bit. Uh, India uh, exports reduced a million, a million tons, uh, partially offset by higher uh, exports from Thailand. Um, ending stocks uh, a bit higher there. That's mainly uh, Thailand, higher production there, and, and a handful of other uh, small changes as well. U.S. Uh, rice balance sheet, uh, again, mainly uh, focused on the um, trade uh, side of the balance sheet here. Uh, imports raised a million uh, hundredweight to a record, 40 million uh, hundred. 100 weight, and that is all long grain aromatics, uh, basmati, jasmine coming in from Asia, um, basmati from from uh, from India as well. So just uh, reflecting strong pace of those uh, uh, export uh, imports coming in. Uh, exports shows up as no change, but there's actually some uh, offsetting changes there. Uh, long grain exports raised two million uh, two million hundred weight, perfectly offset by. Uh, uh, Two million hundred weight lower exports of medium and short. Um, average market price raised fifty cents uh, per hundred weight, and that uh, reflects strength in both long grain and southern medium short grain. Moving into corn, uh, global corn production. Essentially, all we uh, uh, what, what we're looking here at, at here is uh, truing up to recent data, government data primarily. Uh, Mexico uh, reduced uh, a million tons. That's an area change based on government data, lower uh, lower harvested area there. Uh, the rest of those changes are basically harvest results. Um, note, worth noting the fairly large increases for uh, Ukraine and Russia based on harvest results, higher yields there, good weather supporting uh, supporting those crops. Global balance sheet, uh, 
coming in with a little bit higher ending uh, beginning stocks uh, this month. Uh, that is mainly uh, reflecting some back year adjustments in uh, the Mexico carrying by uh, Mexico and Ukraine. And uh, what's, uh, what else worth noting here? Uh, feed use uh, higher, that is primarily a, um, reflecting larger crops in Russia and the EU, so greater feed use there. Also uh, higher feed use in Egypt and a handful of other uh, countries contributing to that as well. Uh, trade up 1.2, uh, 1.8 million tons. That is uh, Ukraine, United States, which we'll talk about shortly, and Turkey. Our Ukraine exports, we raised a million tons, and it's now at 21 million, um, uh, 21 million tons, and that sets up, but uh, still down about 6 million tons year over year. Uh, ending stocks uh, higher in Ukraine, Russia, but partially offset by lower ending stocks in the U.S. Speaking of the U.S., here's our uh, uh, this month's balance sheet. And again, uh, the changes are focused just on the uh, trade side, uh, exports in particular. Uh, U.S. Uh, relatively uh, competitively priced globally. I've seen some strength in the export sales. Uh, so uh, this uh, 25 million bushel increase reflects that recent strength, including uh, strong sales base to Mexico. Uh, as well recently. So with those higher exports, no change on the supply side, tightens up pending stocks by the, by the exact amount, 25 million bushels lower. No change in the season average market price. Moving into soybeans, um, uh, global soybean production put up the back year, 2022, 2023 here as well, because it's worth noting that we uh, increased our uh, uh, Brazil production forecast. Again, this is for the back year. You might recall we did the same thing last month as well, just reflecting the fact that uh, given the pace of their exports and uh, you know that crop, it turned out to be bigger than than, than we expected. So we made the uh, this two million uh, ton adjustment this month. Similarly, we made that adjustment last month as well. So that uh, that big crop keeps getting bigger. And uh, now for the uh, out year, uh, new crop year. Um, We'll talk a little bit more about Brazil. We uh, we reduced our production forecast two million tons there this month, uh, still up year over year, and uh, and then Canada's production was increased three hundred thousand tons based on government reports. One country not listed there, but worth noting, uh, Russia soybean production was also increased based on government data. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about Brazil. Uh, it's been in the news a lot lately, uh, kind of a little bit of a complicated situation, but just as a reminder, uh, the main production areas of Brazil, and if you break it down, there's basically two primary major production regions, the tropical uh, areas to the north and the subtropical areas to the south. Um, planting still underway, uh, wrapping up in some parts, but uh, will continue into January for in, in parts of the country. And uh, normally, so again, I mentioned the two, two parts of the country. We have the, um, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the monsoon, the uh, area, the, the tropical areas where you have the, uh, the typical rainfall pattern of the uh, rains, uh, you know, starting out slow and then picking up through time. Here we are in early December. This is where we should be in terms of that uh, 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 rainy season, uh, but bottom line, that rainy season has been delayed, especially in the southern parts of Mato Grosso. So uh, uh, suffering dry conditions right now, a little bit different situation in the southern part of, uh, in, in the southern regions of Brazil. But when we look in particular at Mato Grosso, especially the southern part of Mato Grosso, uh, rain, the, the rains have been slow to come, uh, well below their average pace. Not far different from last year's um, rain, rainfall trace, but the one, the main difference this year is that it's been just an awfully lot hotter. Um, a lot of heat if you compare it to last year, temperatures are almost around average. This year we're a couple standard deviations above average. So very hot, dry, very hot, delayed, um, delayed uh, start of the rainy season, but that rainy season is starting to be, you know, it is starting up now. So looking ahead, things look a bit better. Now, when we look at the Southern parts of the country, so uh, there's uh, rainfall trace for uh, uh, Paraná 
2023, you can see abundant rainfall, um, you know, well above even last year's pace, which was good. Uh, so, you know, you know, bordering on almost excessive, but uh, certainly a, a lot of rain uh, in that part of the country. Similarly, Rio Grande de Sol, very abundant rains there as well. Much different from last year where we suffered a, you know, where they suffered a fairly severe uh, drought conditions. So a lot of rain in the southern parts of the country, delayed rainfall in the northern parts of the country. And, uh, and it shows up on satellite data as well regarding uh, the, you know, um, uh, drought conditions in the, in the north. A lot of um, uh, rain, nearly excessive rain in the southern parts of the country. Uh, we don't think that, I mean, at this point, I mean, the pattern has been when you look back at analog years, uh, a lot of rain tends to mean higher yields. So we're not uh, anticipating that the, those rains are so high that they're going to be detrimental to yields. If anything, they're positive at this point. So good conditions in the, um, uh, in, in the south, offsetting, you know, less than favorable start to the season in the north. And, uh, and the result is we pulled the production, uh, our production forecast back 2 million tons. But still, even with that, um, that's the uh, second highest yield on record, um, uh, highest production on record, uh, so re record high production, second highest yield, and um, you know just a, a bit below trend uh, in terms of the yield. Still a, a long season ahead here to continue to watch this crop. All right, let me just get caught up on my notes. All right, so um, global uh, soybean balance sheet. Uh, beginning stocks up a little bit this month, mainly reflecting, that That largely reflects that uh, in change in Brazil production that I mentioned earlier for the back year, um, increased supplies there carrying into the new crop year. Uh, Trade, uh, so that's exports, uh, global soybean exports up 2 million tons this month. That also reflects Brazil, strong um, pace of exports from Brazil. Uh, ending stocks tightening up a little bit. Uh, and, uh, and and as you can see, uh, well, uh, we can't see, but I'll explain actually. Uh, ending stocks tightening up a bit higher in China uh, and lower in Brazil. So that Globally, that's kind of how that offsets. And you can see uh, we uh, raised our China import forecast uh, by 2 million tons there as well, reflecting that strong demand. U.S. balance sheet, nothing really here to report. No new information, um, nothing from NAS and uh, uh, nothing worth adjusting on any of the other demand on, on the demand side either. So now let's move into cotton. Uh, global cotton production, a couple changes here worth noting. Of course, the big change is in the U.S., which we'll talk about uh, shortly, um, tightening up supplies in the U.S., but also lower production in Turkey. That's based on a post report. Uh, and uh, Pakistan up a bit, offsetting some of that decline in Turkey. And that is based on arrivals data. Uh, so that uh, coming in strong, so that crop is uh, turning out to be a little bit bigger than previously anticipated. Global cotton balance sheet, uh, beginning stocks, a uh, little adjustment there, mainly refle reflecting various data adjustments for the back year, but uh, including importantly, historical adjustments to Bangladesh, um, Bangladesh consumption. And, uh, uh, and then production, that is large, uh, production side of the balance sheet, that's largely a U.S. story, again, which we'll talk about shortly. And uh, consumption, we pulled back, as you can see there, by 1.6 million bales. Uh, and that, it, you know, largely a China story, uh, but also Turkey as well. Um, pulled back our consumption forecast for Turkey. Uh, but China consumption down, but their imports continue to, to grow. We raised China's imports by half a million uh, bales. Uh, and that means their stocks are growing and uh, they're growing their state reserves. Um, but um, although this, this value here, it's still mostly private, uh, privately owned stocks, but about half a million are, uh, are uh, state reserves. 
U.S. balance sheet. So this is where we incorporated the information that uh, Chris talked about uh, earlier, uh, tighter, uh, lower yields in the U.S., tightening up U.S. production uh, by uh, 310,000 bales. Uh, the other notable change here is mill use uh, down this month uh, based on AMS data. Um, and uh, so when you work, work it through the balance sheet, ending stocks tightening up by 100,000 bales this month, um, didn't make any change in our price. Um, prices over the past several months have been relatively steady, uh, but uh, so nothing to change there, but uh, ending stocks tightening up. And now back to the mill use uh, reduction this month, just put this up. Uh, this chart up for uh, for a little bit of perspective on, uh, in terms of where we are. Note the scale on this going all the way back to 1874 and where we are right now. Basically, uh, mill use in the U.S. is back to levels of the late 1880s or so. Um, really interesting pattern. You can and if you'd kind of walk through some of the uh, you know, changes over time. This big spike here is, you know, likely reflecting NAFTA, CAFTA, some of these uh, Western Hemisphere trade agreements, and then, and then we had the big uh, in, rise in China and um, China production, and, and you see our our mill use go down. So, um, so just a you know notable pattern there, and it, again, putting U.S. mill use back to the uh, late 1880s uh, levels. So now we'll talk about sugar. I'm going to change things up a little bit here. Normally, I uh, talk about the domestic balance sheet first, but um, I'm going to start with the Mexico sugar balance sheet this time because it's the Mexico sugar balance sheet's the balance sheet that's driving most of the changes that I'm going to talk about in the U.S. balance sheet. And uh, what we're seeing here, uh, we lowered Mexico's production uh, forecast by 47 thousand metric tons and that that that's mainly based on uh, information from post uh, post estimate reflecting the fact that it's been you know drought conditions in several important uh, sugar pro uh, producing areas of, uh, of Mexico so supplies tightening up in Mexico um, Cana de Suca uh, report uh, reports that about 11.8 percent of Mexico's production um, is expected to be low pole sugar. That will all be exported to the U.S. and um, and then and that low pole sugar accounts for about seventy five percent of Mexico's total exports to the U.S. So that is where we come up with the Mexico export forecast of one hundred ninety five thousand metric tons. That's mostly to the U.S. There's a little bit also to other countries. I think there's twenty five thousand tons or so that go to uh, some other countries. But this is mostly coming to the U.S. Um, uh, with uh, exporting less, you know, um, Mexico then also needs to import less to to target their uh, ending stocks total. But the key takeaway from this Mexico sugar balance sheet is the reduction in exports to the U.S. from last year. And then translating those Mexico ex exports into um, U.S. units, into U.S. imports from Mexico. So now we're switching from metric tons to uh, short ton raw value. Uh, uh, imports from Mexico were reduced to 227,000 short ton raw value. Um, it, it, I'll just note here too that yeah we you know we made a small changes on the production side um, uh, based on information we got from uh, uh, from NAS regarding the cane, but those are relatively minor. The main thing to to focus again on here is that U.S. supplies relatively tight, uh, Mexico exporting all they can to the US, but that is not enough to reach 13.5% stocks to use ratio. Um, we, as you can see here, again, like we did last month, we increased our high tier uh, import forecast pretty strongly this month up above last year's level. So uh, uh, 10,000 tons above last year's total. Um, and it's just, you know, given the high prices, there's gonna be incentive for that 
for that sugar to come in uh, at the high tier. Also just worth noting, uh, TRQ imports we increased as well, reflecting that uh, reallocation to the uh, TRQ late in November, but we're still forecasting a bit of a shortfall there as well. So, so there's where we are on sugar, uh, ending up with stocks to use ratio of 12.8%. All right, let's move into livestock. Um, relatively small changes on, on our uh, livestock uh, balance sheets this month. Uh, beef production shows up as no change. There's some offsets there, a little bit lower slaughter pace, a little bit higher weights for 2023. Uh, for 2024, um, mainly uh, what driving a little bit of an increase there, uh, reflecting higher placements now and you know lower marketings now excuse me um yeah providing more supplies early next year so uh uh so that's driving that change uh pork and broilers for for 2023 again we're mainly just uh truing up to recent slaughter data so pork up a little bit broilers up a little bit uh, for 2024 pork, we didn't make any change to our production forecast, and uh, you know at this point we don't want to get uh, don't want to get out ahead of the hogs and pigs reports coming out soon. Uh, that will give some um, uh, you know better information on producer intentions and whatnot. So we'll be watching that closely and incorporating that, of course, into our January report. Uh, turkey. Um, uh, production down both 2023 and 2024. Just uh, yeah, and, that, and that's been we we've been trimming that back for several months, and it's just uh, relatively weak demand. Uh, and and as you can see, declining prices as well. So that's more indication that it's a demand driver um, behind that reduction. So prices, uh, steer prices, we pulled back dollar uh, seventy five per hundred weight. Um, for 2023, just again based on observed prices, and uh, you know we've seen a re you know relatively slow marketings and weak packer margins, so that's driving some of that uh, uh, slowness in the marketings. And then going ahead into 2024, we're well pulled pulled prices back fairly uh, substantially there as well. You can see that some concerns about beef demand going forward uh, following off of uh, recent uh, relative weakness. Um, hog prices uh, down 2023, again, ample supplies there, weighing on prices. And then that uh, 25 cent reduction for 2024, that's um, uh, all in the first quarter as well, carry through to relatively weak, weaker prices right now. Uh, broilers and turkey, poultry, again, just kind of truing up to observe prices um, uh, for 2023 and tw and for Turkey for next year. Again, uh, it's a it, it's a sector that's uh, facing some concerns about demand, uh, and that's uh, reflecting that relatively uh, large reduction in our price forecast this month for 2024, and fairly big reduction year over year, as you can see. Meat trade. Um, uh, again, 2023, we're close to the end of the year here. So we're just kind of truing up data. Uh, broilers and turkeys up a bit, reflecting maybe not too surprising, lower prices. Uh, many markets, no, nothing really stands out there. Uh, for 2024, of course, the one that stands out is the 100 um, million pound reduction in pork uh, exports. And that, that reflects lower demand in Asia, including China. Um, and I'm sure you've seen the reports about the uh, the pork market and hog market in China being weak. So they're going to be importing less, and that just uh, undermines our undermines all countries' exports to uh, to China and, and the rest of Asia as well. Um, beef imports uh, up again a little bit this month, just reflecting demand for processing grade beef. Finish things off here with dairy. Um, 2023 milk production down a bit. Uh, that That is all reflecting lower milk per cow. For 2024, uh, we uh, reduced our forecast there as well by a billion pounds. That's a combination of uh, lower milk per cow and lower cow numbers. 
Um, in terms of the exports and imports, uh, fat basis and skim solids basis, it can kind of be summarized by, in terms of the, you know, fat products, uh, prices are relatively strong. So higher imports, strong imports, lower exports. Um, skim solids, on the other hand, a little bit more competitive. So uh, fewer imports, higher exports. Um, so, uh, so in particular, you know, looking ahead into 2024, uh, fat basis imports higher. That's mainly butter and cheese. Um, skim solids basis uh, uh, exports and imports. We're looking mainly at whey and non-fat dry milk. Finishing things off here with prices. Uh, yeah, you know, again, relatively small adjustments this month. Um, a few that don't even show up because they round to zero. 2023 cheese prices actually uh, uh, half a cent lower uh, in this month. Uh, 2024 expect that uh, you know relative weakness to continue into 2024. So 10 cents uh, per pound lower uh, there. Um, uh, butter prices down as well in 2023, but still relatively high. And again, we're just kind of truing up to recent price data here. Non-fat dry, again, it doesn't show up because it rounds to zero, but there's a, a little bit less than a half cent increase in the non-fat dry milk price as well. Um, so all that, uh, so how that translates into the class prices, um, class three prices for 2023 down, um, Five cents per hundred weight. That is mainly reflecting those lower cheese prices. Uh, butter uh, driving lower butter prices, driving a, a reduction in the class four price, and then into looking into twenty twenty four. Um, again, uh, lower cheese prices partly offset by uh, higher whey prices, driving class three prices down. And class four prices being supported by some strength in the non-fat dry milk prices. And all milk, when you add it all together, all milk prices reduced for both years, down 10 cents per hundred weight uh, for the you know, balance of this year and uh, reduced 55 cents per hundred weight in 2024. And, uh, and that is all I got in terms of the uh, official presentation. So I Thank you all for attending. I hope uh, I hope this was useful. I hope you learned something. And uh, for all of you uh, who joined online, uh, thanks for joining us. And uh, we will see you back here next month.